You are now listening to The Real Health Podcast with Dr. Taylor Crick. Episode 6 is on gut health. This episode is a live recording hosted at Align Family Chiropractic in Salt Lake City, Utah. All right, you guys, so we're going to go ahead and get started. Tonight we're talking about gut health. This is my second favorite topic to talk about. Can anybody guess what my first is? Yes, exactly. Spinal alignment. Because I think this is the second most important part of your health, is your gut health. What do, what do you guys think of when you hear the word gut or guts? Does anybody think that that's a weird word? Kind of. When I first heard that, I was like, gut. I've never, I never used that word. But now this week, since we've had the workshop, I've said it so many times that it doesn't sound right anymore. But did anybody else think that that's kind of a, an odd word to use? But what do you guys think of when you hear the word gut? Shout some things out. What comes to mind? Intestines, stomach, stomach. Gut, feeling. gut feeling. That's what I think of, Rick. That's what I would say is, you know, something like, you know, no guts, no glory, right? Where did that come from? Uh, you don't have the guts or I have a gut feeling, right? And that one we're going to talk about because the gut feeling is actually a pretty cool thing. A lot of your neurotransmitters, a lot of your feelings are actually coming from your gut. So that's no joke that you can actually feel it in your gut. But here's what, what I think of when I first heard the word guts. And I'm going to give brownie points to anybody who knows what this is. Does anybody know what that is? You probably have to be around my age. It's a Nickelodeon thing. Yeah. Like yep. Yep. Do you know what the show is called? Guess, we're talking about it. I do know quite a bit of... Um, guts. Guts, yes. This show, this show shaped, my, shaped my childhood. This is kind of pixelated, I noticed, because it wasn't exactly 1080 in 1992. But uh, this was an awesome show. But that's what I always think of, was this old, old show, Guts. And I never really knew what that meant when I first started hearing the term gut health and first started doing research on this. But you know, the first thing that we want to talk about is you know, give a background of you know, why this is important. So what, what is the gut? What are we referring to when we say that? Because you said stomach, you said intestines. So the gut is really your digestive tract every step of the way. So from the time that food enters your mouth to the time that food leaves your body, right? Everything else, it's inside the gut. So if you really think about this, the gut is just literally a tube. And some parts of the tube are different sizes than others, but the food stays within that tube all the way from your mouth till the time that it, that it gets out. So it starts with the teeth, it starts in the mouth. So the teeth, a lot of people don't think of the teeth as being a digestive organ. That's it. They're incredibly, incredibly important for your digestion because they start the process. They start to break up your food, start to chomp it up. Then your mouth, your mouth releases enzymes. So they're salivary enzymes, which means they're in your saliva. We talked about at one of the quick shops we talked about how if you put a you know, saltine cracker in your mouth and you just leave it there, you don't chew or anything, you just leave it sit there, it will turn to sugar. And you can taste it. It's sweet. It turns to sugar. Those are the salivary enzymes that are starting the process of breaking down your food. The next step is the esophagus. That's your food just traveling down, getting to your stomach. Then it's the stomach, then the intestines, then it makes its way out through your colon and rectum. So that is the tube. The other thing, though, that I want to mention while we have this slide up is that you know, we think of the gut, or we think of, one of the biggest things that, that I wanna encourage you guys right at the very beginning is to think about this. There's two ways of thinking, two different camps of thinking. Mechanistic versus vitalistic. And what mechanistic means is that the body is, is a mechanism, like a car is. If you have a bad muffler, you can take a muffler off and put a new muffler on. That's the way that medicine thinks about the body. Got a bad knee, let's replace it. Got a bad hip, let's replace it. Got a bad gallbladder, let's take it out. That's mechanistic, but all those things have effects in other areas of the body. And vitalistic, a vitalistic approach says the body is more than just the sum of its parts. We can't say that just because we're taking a gallbladder, or because the gallbladder is damaged, that we can take it out and it's not going to affect other organs. It's gonna have other systemic effects because we're more than just the sum of our parts. So when we're talking about the specific areas of the gut tonight, I don't want you to get hung up on, I have a gallbladder problem, I have an intestine problem, I have a colon problem, I have a, an ulcer problem in my stomach. Think of your body as a bigger picture and as you know, the amazing self-healing, self-regulating organism that it is. Because that's what we're always talking about, right? And that's why essential number one is maximize your mindset because you have to change the way that you think about the body and about its individual functions and individual parts. So what is the gut? In, so food moves through the gut in two processes called peristalsis and segmentation. Those aren't necessarily important, but if you think about it, 
How many people have ever been to a soccer game, baseball game, football game where they did the wave? Everybody's seen that, right? And if the wave, if everybody's working in unison, it just goes around the stadium, right? That's exactly how your gut works. That's like peristalsis. That first word is peristalsis. Your gut is nothing more. We said it was a tube, right? It's nothing more than a, a series of ring of muscle. So those muscles contract in the right order, and your food just keeps moving through the way that it's supposed to. Segmentation is another process. Segmentation is, is similar. It's kind of like when you squeeze the toothpaste from the end. You know, you start from the bottom and you start squeezing it out to the top. That's a different process that's just happening in the musculature of your gut. But that's an important thing is, you know, your food has to pass through there, but it doesn't just, it's not gravity that does it. It's muscular contractions that keep the food moving through there. And you want it to move through at a specific speed. You don't want it to move through too fast. You don't want it to move through too slow. So the first part of the gut, the mouth, the stomach, the pancreas, the, those areas secrete enzymes. And so if you just think about your food, you think about what it looks like when you eat it, and you think about what it looks like when, you're, when it's done, they don't look the same, right? So there's a lot of processes that have to happen in between there. The first one is that those, those food particles have to start getting broken down. So the teeth start that. They just start chewing it up, chopping it up. But then these enzymes start to break down, start to break down food molecules, start to break down proteins. So you've started the process of breaking your food down. If you think about the order in which the gut goes, the mouth and the stomach, and then the pancreas really secretes a lot of your digestive enzymes. We're gonna talk a little bit later, a little bit more about digestive enzymes, but the majority of those come from your pancreas. There are some secreted in the, in the stomach, some from the mouth, but the majority of those come from the pancreas. That's also, that's what's called an accessory digestive organ, because that is not part of the tube, right? The food never goes into the pancreas. The food never goes into the gallbladder. Those are accessory organs that help. They secrete things into the tube to help things move smoothly, to help things break down smoothly, but that's not necessarily part of the gut. It's considered an accessory organ there. Most of the absorption, though, of your vitamins, of your minerals, of your nutrients, of your calories, of the things that you need, takes place lower in the gut. So if you think about the first half of the gut, from here up, is breaking the foods down so that they can be absorbed and assimilated. Because what we always talk about is, you know, you are what you eat, but more importantly, you are what you're able to absorb and able to assimilate. Because if you're eating the best food in the world, but you're not able to absorb and assimilate it, you're not getting the nutrients, then you're not getting the benefit from it. So you gotta make sure that you're, you're not only what you eat, you gotta make sure that you're absorbing it too. Um, and so most of that happens in the small intestine. In the large intestine, at the very end, there's a couple things that get absorbed there. Water uh, and also like B vitamins, or, or several vitamins, but B vitamins are probably the biggest one that get absorbed in the colon. But that is mostly water. Water is the biggest thing. So why should you care? That, that's a big question to ask, right? Because we, a lot of us, you know, the anatomy is important, it's, and I think it's important to have a background for what we're talking about to understand kind of the anatomy. But why you care is because your digestive tract, if you think about it, think about that tube, its, it's only responsibility is keep the bad out and let the good in, right? So your food, it, you, it's keeping the bad stuff out. That's your waste. That's the stuff that you're getting rid of. That's the stuff that your body doesn't need. But it's taking in the things that it needs. So this is an incredibly important thing when you consider how much food you're eating, how many times you're eating throughout the day. You want the good to be able to get in, and you want the bad to stay out. And this is the barrier. This is the guardian. If you think about it, you know, an easy analogy is like if, we had, if this was a screened-in you know, screened porch, Right? And say, say, let's make it a little, little more, uh, say we're in a screened-in porch and we're in West Africa and there's mosquitoes out there with malaria, right? And none of us have malaria vaccines because we don't vaccinate. Uh, just kidding. Um, but, but say that the, the screen has holes in it. What's that going to let in? Yeah, and is that a good thing or a bad thing? That's a bad thing. That's exactly what's happening with the gut. So a little bit later we're going to talk about leaky gut. That's what we mean. It's just like a screen. You want to keep the bugs out, but you want the cool air to come in. And that's exactly what the gut does. It keeps the bad out, but lets the good in. But the common symptoms, you know, the symptoms that you think about when you think about gut health, and maybe one of these symptoms is what, is what brought you here. You know, heartburn, 
ulcers, indigestion, uh, constipation, diarrhea, bloating, pain, all these typical GI symptoms, those, if you have those, you understand that you have a problem with your gut. You can feel it and that's where it is. You say, hey, it's right here, it's in my gut. Some of the other conditions though, those are the bigger concerns. And there's other GI dis diseases that are a little more serious, like GI disease, celiac disease, we're gonna talk about that, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, IBS, which is irritable bowel syndrome, IBD, irritable bowel disease, uh, two names for very similar conditions. But those are the ones that if you have them, you know you have a gut issue, right? But the other ones that, we, you know, that we've had on posters around the office like this, thyroid conditions, autoimmunity, those are the scary ones and those are the ones that you know, it's harder to draw a direct connection between your gut because that's not necessarily where you feel the pain at. So that's why you have to have this vitalistic approach and this vitalistic way of thinking to know that your gut affects more than just your gut. So some of the things, uh, some of the things that are, this, these two slides are switched, I'm sorry. But why should you care if you don't have GI symptoms? You know, if you're not having pain in your GI tract, why should you care? Well, it's responsible for many other uh, important systemic functions and causes a lot of other diseases. So like we're talking about thyroid conditions, um, depression, anxiety, Autism, ASD is autism spectrum disorder. This is a huge, huge thing. If you talk to an, a parent of an autistic kid or in the autistic community, they will all be familiar with gut health. Not all, but 90% of them will have looked into gut health. They will have tried things like gluten-free, casein-free diets because it's heavily, heavily linked and they see great results when they start to focus on the gut health. Allergies, ADHD, concentration issues are a big one stemming from the gut. And we're gonna talk about exactly how that happens. Acne, things that present on the skin. And a lot of immune system issues. That is the biggest concern, and that's my biggest concern and the biggest problem. The autoimmunity, I'd say that that's the worst of all. Uh, and if you look at the charts of, you know, this ends at 2000 too. So this is not exactly a new chart. And what do you think, do you think it's gotten better since 2000 or do you think it's probably gotten worse? It's continued to get worse, yeah. But you can see over the last 50 years, now there's over 100 immune-mediated diseases affecting over 50 million people in our country. And it's the number one cause for chronic disease, or second highest cause for chronic disease, number one cause for morbidity in women. And if you know anybody that has an autoimmune condition, you know, we see quite a few in here, and it's heavily prevalent in women more so than men. I don't know why, but it's much more prevalent in women than in men. But if you look in other countries, most of these diseases are very, very rare. So some of these on the chart, you might not be able to see them back there, but multiple sclerosis, Crohn's disease, type 1 diabetes, even asthma is on there. And this is from the New England Journal of Medicine. But autoimmunity is when your immune system decides to attack your own body. Your immune system is designed to attack foreign objects, right? Bad things, bacteria, viruses, things that aren't supposed to be in there. But when it starts attacking your own tissues, that's what's called autoimmunity. And that leads to a lot of, a lot of effects down the road systemically. So that's one of the biggest concerns and one of the biggest reasons why we're having this workshop tonight because the gut is related to so many things that a lot of people just aren't familiar with or just don't know. So the first thing that we're gonna talk about, and this is gonna be the most important thing to talk about tonight. Uh, this is the gut bacteria. Okay, so raise your hand if you've heard the word probiotic. Yeah, so everyone in the room almost. Um, and that's because we hear it on commercials now, and it's starting to become mainstream medical uh, literature. There's enough literature out there that even you might even go to a doctor. If it's a good doctor, he might recommend you a probiotic. Uh, when we had our babies, the pediatrician recommended a probiotic. I was excited. Uh, vitamin D and probiotic. But the reason that this is so important is because you have so many of these bacteria in your digestive tract. You actually have nine to ten times more bacteria in your digestive tract than you have cells in your entire body. Does anybody know how many cells you have in your body or guess? You haven't counted them? Come on. Now you have 75 trillion, they estimate. 75 trillion cells in your body. You have nine to 10 times more the number of bacteria in your gut. So this flora is what it's called, the microflora or the microbiome. This is what's so incredibly important. And that's why you hear so much about probiotics today is because this, this flora is really important. And it's not necessarily just all good bacteria. You need to have a good balance of good bacteria and bad bacteria. You don't want it to erase all your bad bacteria because you need some of it, but you also don't want it to grow out of control. 
Uh, and so that's some of the things that we're going to talk about right now. This is just a little intro to the gut bacteria, but we're going to talk about it in a little bit more detail. There's over 5,000 different species of different gut bacteria. And if you, and if you have looked at the uh, supplement store, you know, I was just talking to a patient about shopping for a probiotic, it can get a little dizzying. There's a lot out there. There's a lot to choose from. And we always say that going to the supplement store, or going to the vitamin aisle is, looking at, is like looking at alphabet soup. There's all these vitamin A's and B's and C's and D's. And it's hard to decipher which one is going to work best for you. So that's what we're going to try to narrow down for you tonight. Which one, if you need a probiotic, which one is going to be the best option or kind of why you should be taking them. But here's the thing too about the microbiome. They're currently mapping uh, the microbiome, like kind of how they did the Human Genome Project, but everybody's a little bit different. So that you never know exactly what one person needs versus what another person needs, because every single one of us is a little bit different based on our, our past lives, based on our genetics too, based on you know, where we came from. Uh, there are ple people that will you know, immigrate to a new country, and the foods that the natives there can handle fine, they just can't handle because they don't genetically have the same microbiome to handle those foods. So that's an incredibly important part that's really going to be the focus of the whole talk tonight is this microbiome of your gut bacteria. Why should you care about that, though? You know, why should you care about the 750 trillion bacteria in your gut? Well, your gut's called your second brain for a reason, because it's responsible for so many functions and because it emulates your brain in many areas. It controls a lot of things, like how we're talking about with concentration, with mood, and especially serotonin is one of the biggest things. So you see that word serotonin. Your gut produces about 90% of your body's serotonin. Does anybody, have a, a, does anybody know or have a guess, or what do you think of when you hear the word serotonin? Brain, Brain sleep, anything else? Happy, the happiness. That is the happiness uh, neurotransmitter. So like your, your medications like Prozac, those are called SSRIs, uh, your antidepressants. That stands for selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. So they affect your serotonin levels when your body's not producing the right amount of serotonin. But that comes from the gut. We always think that it's in the brain and that's where it takes effect. But it's built in the gut. It comes from the bacteria. And it's the bacteria itself that produce the serotonin. It also controls about 80% of your immune system. There's what's called the, it's called G-A-L-T. I'll write it up here. It's GALT, G-A-L-T. It's called your gut-associated lymph tissue. So your lymph system is what takes, the, takes your food or takes the particles from your gut, and that's what integrates them into the immune system. So your lymph system is part of your immune system, and when these bad proteins, bad toxins, get through a leaky gut, they get into the lymph system. And this GALT, this is a large, large part of your immune system, is directly next to the gut. And so when things can leak through or leaky gut affects the, the GALT, the GALT tissue is what it's called. That's a hard word to say. But your immune system, that's how or why a lot of your immune system is controlled through your gut. You may have heard that before. Like I know Erin Andrews, does anybody know who Erin Andrews is? She's an ESPN announcer, but she's got a commercial for probiotics, and that's how she starts it off with. She says 70 to 80 percent of your immune system is controlled by your gut. She's selling you know, some kind of probiotic. But that's a big one, and that's why it affects so heavily autoimmunity and other immune-mediated diseases, because your immune system, like we said, that's the first line of defense to let the good in and keep the bad out. So when the bad gets in, that's right where it's going. It's right to your immune system and triggering a response from your immune system. So that's why that's so important. The skin conditions like acne, eczema, psoriasis, affects the thyroid. Uh, actually, your gut bacteria is responsible for a conversion of what's called T3 to T4. And those are two incredibly important thyroid hormones. If you've ever had a thyroid test, you've seen those results on your test. There's different ratios they can run. But T3 and T4 has to be, tra or has to be converted. T4 has to be tra converted from T3, and your gut bacteria is actually what performs that action. Allergies to foods and other environmental allergens. This is an immune response. An allergy is an immune response. And if you think about it, we always talk about different resistance levels. How many in here have been having hay fever lately or are allergic to like pollen? Anybody allergic to pollen? Pollen's a good example that like 
you know, some people have an allergy, and you may think, why do I have one and the person next to me doesn't? But we all have a little bit of one, but it's just a different resistance level. If I took a handful of pollen and threw it in somebody's face that wasn't allergic to it, they might have a response. They just have a higher resistance level to it. So this is one of the biggest ways that an allergy begins is in the gut. A food allergies are a huge thing. So celiac disease, that's gluten insensitivity. The biggest allergens are gluten insensitivity, uh, casein, which is in dairy. So that's why one of the first things if you're having gut issues is to cut out gluten and cut out dairy because of the gluten and casein. That's why I mentioned that autistic community, very, very big into gluten-free, casein-free diet. Some of the other big allergens, eggs, eggs are a really big one. Soy is a really big one, and this is going to be tested, um, but you can also do an elimination diet where if you feel like you're having a response to something, or you feel like something that you're eating is causing you, and you don't know what it is, it's causing you symptoms after you eat it, you don't know what it is, it's a good idea to start a food journal, cut something out of your diet, like cut eggs out for a couple weeks, see how you respond, and then reintroduce them, see what it does. That's another way that you can just kind of test yourself for food allergies or food sensitivities. But any environmental allergen can also stem from the gut because the immune system just gets overactive and it starts attacking things that it shouldn't. And that's what an allergy is. It's that your body is attacking something because it thinks that it's harmful. And it may be to your body, but that's the thing about the resistance levels is it's not harmful to me, then why would it be harmful to you? We need to raise our resistance levels um, and to look at the cause of these allergies. So the microflora, I want to show you guys exactly where these species uh, sit at. Because when you go to the store, like I said, you'll find lactobacillus. You'll find all these different strains. And there's a lot of different options. But you need to know which strains are in which areas of the gut uh, versus others compared to what symptoms that you're having. So as you work your way down, the most, the most that we're going to talk about are in the intestines, the intestinal microflora. Um, and so, but when you work your way down, they're, they're all the way in there. So they're in the stomach. That's mostly the lactobacillus uh, strain. That's one that a lot of us have heard of, or if you've seen, or if you've ever looked at the shelf at probiotics, you've definitely seen that one. It's one of the highest recommended ones. But what I'm going to show you later is that, is that you can get, you can cover all your bases in a broad spectrum probiotic. But then the next one we go down, strepto, is, what, what does that sound like? Yeah, streptococcus, strep throat. <coughs> Lactobacilli again. But then there's the most down here, the most in the, in the intestines. So that's where you get the most. And this is the number you know, of how many are in there. So the most are actually in the very, very lower part of the intestines. That's where you're having the most bacteria and the most microflora. But this is just a cool, kind of a cool illustration because if you see, you know, like uh, a lot of probiotics will have... 10 strains, and you'll think that that's quite a bit, but when you hear that there are 5,000 of them out there, that's only scratching the surface. Uh, but that's the, the ones that are the most important right there. Can you take a picture of it? Yeah, sure, if you want to, Nancy. Thank you. I'd like to get a picture of it. Yes. So the gut bacteria is responsible for a lot of critical functions. One of the biggest ones is breaking down <laughs> food, breaking down big proteins that leak through the gut. They need to be broken down so that your body can get the particles of them that make up the proteins, actually the proteins are made up of other proteins, but they break down further and further and further into digestible and absorbable little pieces. So if you have a big cow's milk protein that's like this, you need it to be broken down into this size to be safe to get into the gut. So we've talked before about the difference between cow's milk and goat's milk, and one of the reasons why goat's milk is better for kids is because cow proteins are cow-sized, goat proteins are goat-sized. Right? They're not nearly as big, so they're not nearly as damaging. And when you have a leaky gut and these big proteins poke through it, it's kind of like if I had a hole in the screen and I poked my finger through it. The hole's just going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. Converting T3 to T4, that's what we talked about with the thyroid hormone. Producing up to 90% of the body's serotonin. And then also maintaining the integrity of the intestinal wall. So when we're talking about leaky gut, we're talking about the integrity of the wall. Can the bad get... Can the bad stay out, and can the good get in? So the bacteria is really important to maintain the integrity of the wall to not let that gut get leaky. So leaky what? How many people had heard of leaky gut before? How many people had heard of it five years ago? 
A lot less. So still a handful, but a lot less. It's becoming mainstream now. You can hear about it really almost anywhere. Um, and if you do it, you know, one of the things about leaky gut that we've mentioned before, if you do a, a literature search on leaky gut, you're not going to find anything because that's not what it's called in the literature. It's called intestinal permeability. So your intestines are permeable. So if you start looking for the medical research that backs this up, you'll find nothing, but you start to look for intestinal permeability, you'll find quite a bit. Instead of letting the good in, keeping the bad out, it's doing the opposite. It's still letting some of the good stuff in, but it's also letting bad in with it. That is, then your immune system recognizes those bad things because they're bad, right? And so it begins to attack them. That's when your immune system starts to get thrown up. That's what's, you know, the first sign of a food insensitivity or a food allergy. And I'm going to show you a graphic of that in a second. Of the order that this happens, the first thing that happens is a food sensitivity. Then that leads to an immune response. Then down the road, it cascades into autoimmunity. So this is the gut. So this is what we want to see. So this, you can see up here, there's some things like casein. That's the protein that we talked about, the dairy protein. There's toxins up there. There's gluten, another big protein. So we want those to stay out there until they're broken down. But these over here, so these are gut cells. Can everybody see that? They're, they're tightly packed together. There's junctions in between them, though, because there are, like we said, you know, 75 trillion cells in our body. They all have tight junctions in the gut. There needs to be intestinal wall permeability. What leaky gut is, is when these junctions through here start to get bigger and start to get wider in between the enterocytes, which is just a name for a gut cell, uh, for the lining of your gut. So then the toxins can get through. This is a blood vessel, so they go right into your bloodstream. Somebody asked me the other night, they said, and they heard I was doing a leaky gut talk, they said, well, what does it leak into? Well, that's a great question, but it leaks into the bloodstream. It goes into the bloodstream, and that's where your body mounts an attack on it. So there are gluten getting through there, toxins getting through there, casein getting through there. So this is a pretty good illustration of it. Uh, but this is a better one. This shows all, all the different things that get through get through that leaky gut. But then, here's the bloodstream again. You can see those bad things floating through it. And you can see the order, the cascade of disease or the cascade of problems that happens. Intestinal wall or intestinal barrier dysfunction is the first thing. So that's the leaky gut. Then things are going to get through. Your immune system is going to respond. Food allergies or food intolerances. If we leave those and allow those to continue, begin to, to have immune system abnormalities. So that can be as small as an allergy, or it can be as big as autoimmunity. And that's the next thing, that's the next step that it will eventually lead to, or can eventually lead to, is autoimmunity. So that's a concern that if you're having anything up here, you don't want it to get down here. And if you're having anything down here, you want to work your way back up. So one of the first things is healing and sealing your gut so that the stuff stops leaking in. So here's what we really want to focus on tonight, though. You know, I want to give a little background, but we could talk about the anatomy and, you know, the diseases and the prevalence of them all night long, but the biggest thing and the most important thing is going to be action steps and what can you do about it. If you have a bad gut, how can you make it go good? Or if you have a good gut, how can you keep it from going bad? Does everybody agree that the action is what's going to make the difference? Everybody agree? Everybody say action. Action. Nice. Nancy, you were early on that one. You were ready. <laughs> so there's a lot of critical components, you know, like the gallbladder, like the pancreas, but we can't cover all of those in detail. Uh, so the most important thing is what? Action. 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 A couple people were ready. So here are the top five ways that a good gut goes bad. So I know that there's a notes section for this. We're going to spend more time on how you get a bad gut to go good. But if you want to take notes on this, these are the five. So I'll talk about them. So the first one is medications. Uh, and antibiotics are the biggest one because antibiotics literally mean no life, right? Anti means none, and biotic means life. And pro means for, and biotic means life. But antibiotics not only wipe out your bad bacteria, they wipe out your good bacteria too. So that's why antibiotics can really throw off your gut flora in a huge, huge way. I, if you've ever been on an antibiotic, ever, you should be on a probiotic, um, at least for, for some point till you get up to a maintenance phase. But yeah, you should be on some form of probiotic. Raise your hand if you've ever been on an antibiotic. 
More likely, is there anybody in here that's never been on an antibiotic? Nice. Awesome. I, I'm, I'm jealous. Uh, you, a lot of you have heard my story that, you know, my dad's a dentist, so he can prescribe antibiotics. So I was on antibiotics literally probably a week out of the month every, every year for my entire life. Uh, if we had a sniffle, uh, I was, hey, just take the antibiotics in there. If there weren't any, hey, I'll write you a script. Run up to Walgreens. Go get it. Uh, so there was a different, and I'm immune to penicillin. I've been immune to penicillin since I was like three or four because I had so many when I was younger. Um, and I had a antibiotics not only destroy your gut flora, but they do a lot of other bad things too. And they, and they uh, develop resistance too, like how I developed a resistance to penicillin. But that, that's the worst one medication-wise. A lot of the other medications damage the gut lining too. NSAIDs are a really, really bad one. So that's over-the-counter pain pills. NSAIDs, acid blockers, steroids destroy the gut flora, and hormones can all not only destroy the gut flora, but they can also deplete your body of your digestive enzymes. Toxins and medications can deplete your body of the digestive enzymes that it needs to break down your food. So your body has, one of the things with a digestive enzyme that we'll talk about, is your body actually has a, a finite amount of digestive enzymes, which means that it's not unlimited. So you don't have an unlimited supply, and so you can actually run out. And as you get older, it decreases and decreases and decreases, so sometimes you might need to supplement with a digestive enzyme. Well, yeah, you don't run out, like run completely dry, but you supplement. I mean, if you feel like you're having a symptom that you're not breaking down your food well with, then you supplement with a digestive enzyme. No, you'll still, you can, re, you can regenerate and kind of, you have a finite amount, but your body can start producing them better if you stop doing these things. It can improve. It, is, it isn't that you run out and the, and the well runs dry. These will affect it, that does happen with age, but not until much later into, into life. Uh, and by that time, your body's gotten adapted and used to not, it doesn't need as many. It doesn't need as many digestive enzymes. Um, but, uh, sorry Tiffany, I'm trying to answer your question well. Uh, yeah, the well doesn't completely run dry, but you do go less and less and less as you age. So that's why as you age, there's just an increased need for supplementation. Without, there's not really a way to test digestive enzymes that I know of, at least to test the full spectrum. Um, so there's not really a way to know, but a lot of times you can take one, you can take the supplement, and you'll feel a difference. A lot of people have, will feel a difference in energy, will feel a difference in digestion, bloating. Uh, and then we're going to talk about in a minute, too, a couple different ways that you can take digestive enzymes, too, because there's two different ways that you can take them with your food or on an empty stomach that for two different, two completely different reasons. Um, stress. Stress is probably the biggest uh, culprit here for really anything, for really any disease process today. Stress is killing us. Uh, and most people, when they think of stress, they think of just one form of stress, and that's just mental stress. And some, sometimes I'll have patients and I'll say, you know, it, it's stress or stress is contributing to this. And say, well, I have a pretty stress-free lifestyle. Right? But there's a lot of different forms of stress. There's not just the mental stress. There's physical, chemical, emotional stress, and all these things that can happen even without us thinking about it. And if you think about this, too, I was thinking about this the other day. When we're stressed, what do we, what, what do we eat? Do we eat in a hurry, or do we sit down and we take our time? No, we eat in a hurry. When we're stressed, we're like, okay, I'm in a hurry. i got to run through the drive through But then you're putting another kind of stress on your body. You're putting a physical stress in by eating toxic food, by eating processed food. So all the stress, your body doesn't react to one stress any different than the other stresses. Stress isn't a thing. Stress is a response. So that's incredibly important to realize is that stress is a response, and it's, an, and it's a good response. It's a healthy response. You know, if I lift, lift weights with my arms right here, it's a stress, right? I'm putting a stress on the muscle, but that's the only way that it's gonna grow. So stress is actually a good thing, but when you get too much, your body starts to release a hormone called cortisol, and it starts to destroy the gut lining. And it's a vicious cycle. Let's just use this and say that this is a cycle. It's a vicious cycle that cortisol affects the gut, and the gut affects cortisol. So it's a cycle that, unless it's stopped, continues to get worse and worse and worse. So that's one of the, the action steps when we start talking about the things that you should do. We're going to talk about stress again there. But that's one of the big ways that a good gut goes bad. Uh, also, there's physical stress. So if you sit at a desk, uh, if you drive, we have a lot of patients that are drivers, bus drivers, or travel a lot, do a lot of sitting, that is a stress. You know, I heard a speech recently, and they said that you know, stressors are just rocks in your backpack. Right? So unless you're trying to drown, 
Rocks in your backpack are going to make everything in life harder. Right? Nothing's going to be easier if you keep adding rocks in your backpack. And all these different stressors, physical stress, chemical stress, you know, the inversion, uh, the things that we're getting from our food supply, we're all just adding rocks into the backpack. So even if you think you have a stress-free lifestyle as far as you know, your family or your job or maybe you're retired or you, you, know, you ski in the day and you, you relax at night or something, you can still have quite a bit of stress response and that's what I'm talking about is the hormone response that you get from that. Sugar is the next one. So sugar, if you've been part of our office for any period of time, you've heard about sugar. And what do we say, is sugar good or sugar bad? Yeah, yeah that should be, a, everybody should get a 100% on that one. But sugar, they've shown it changes the gut flora immediately. So it changes the ratio of good bacteria and bad bacteria, it feeds some bad bacteria. And one of the biggest, one of the biggest is, is actually uh, candida, which is a yeast overgrowth. Right? Has anybody ever heard that sugar feeds candida? Yeah, so sugar not only feeds candida, it causes, that's just one of the things that can overgrow in the gut from a diet that's too high in sugar. There are other bad bacteria that can take over and overgrow too from sugar, but it's an immediate response. That's also one of the ways that they've measured that when you take in sugar, it immediately decreases your immune system immediately and it stays decreased. I don't remember the exact stat, but it stays decreased for like over an hour. It doesn't kick back up again for over an hour. And most of us, we're just eating sugar and then an hour later we're hungry again, so we eat another piece of sugar, then an hour later. And so our immune system is never at its full capacity. It's never firing on all cylinders because we just keep putting sugar in. The other one is lack of exercise. So lack of exercise has also been shown that's a physical stress. That's a physical stressor. Your body was designed to move, and by not exercising, it's been shown to allow the gut flora to change pretty dramatically. And like sugar, it's been shown that as soon as you exercise, it can immediately change your gut flora after one bout of exercise, immediately. Number five, big, big, big one that destroys the gut flora, toxins. So where are those coming from? Lots of areas. You know, like I just mentioned, the inversion, um, tap, wa tap water, food additives, uh, dirty dozen foods. Does anybody know what the dirty dozen is in the clean 15? We talk about that a lot. So the clean 15 are the 15 foods lowest in pesticide levels when they've tested them. So they're the 15 foods that are the cleanest and safest. So you can buy them conventionally and feel relatively safe with them. The dirty dozen, those are the dirtiest ones, the highest in pesticide loads. When you look at this, this pesticide especially, the biggest one is called glyphosate, and that's Roundup, and it has been shown, Lucas actually just sent me a study or a synopsis of a study uh, where they did research and showed that glyphosate punches holes through the intestinal lining. So that's a huge one. GMOs too, that's a huge one that can punch holes through the intestinal lining. That's genetically modified foods. We're gonna talk about that in a little bit, a little bit more. But that's one of the things that you want to avoid is essential number five, minimizing toxicity. These five though, to me, they look like the five essentials, right? Because if you start from the bottom and work your way up, essential number five over there on the wall or back behind us, if you guys know, don't know the five essentials, essential number five is Minimize your toxins. What's essential number four? Exercise. I'm giving it to you. <laughs> yeah, exercise. Number three is nutrition. But you know the number one staple is at, put good fats in and take sugar out. Those are the two biggest things that we teach here. Sugar. Now stress, that's not the same as essential number two, but essential number two is a huge factor in your physical stress. Your spine, when it's not moving properly, that is a stressor. And number one, medications, that's just kind of uh, goes along with the mindset maybe, um, that you have to change your mindset to stop reaching for the medicine cabinet for everything and think, you know, think vitalistically, think what is the cause of this, what can I do the most naturally, or what, can I, what, what caused this? Because like we always talk about, you know, a headache was never caused by a lack of Excedrin, and a stomach ache is never caused by a lack of Pepto-Bismol. There's causes, and those things can bring symptomatic relief, but then if you're thinking vitalistically, they affect other organs and other systems. They don't, they don't just go in and get rid of your symptoms without any ill effect. There are side effects, or like I, like I like to call them, effects. So those are the top five things of how a good gut goes bad. So these are the things that if you're, gonna, if you're taking notes, you can draw a big stop sign on there. The things not to do or to watch out for or to be really, really aware of because they affect the gut so dramatically. 
But we want to go into, and one other thing before we go into it is with that last one, the toxins and the GMOs and the dirty dozen and the clean 15, I want to show you a couple charts on this because when you see the charts, to me at least, that, that's what um, does it for me. You know, when I can see the visual of the chart because if you hear the argument, you know, you can find anything online. You can find people that say that organic food is harmful. Uh, but there are not very many people say that. But there's a lot of people that say that it doesn't matter if you eat organic or you don't eat organic. But in my opinion, it matters a ton. Because if you look at, this is from 1990 to 2010. So the last 20 years, this black line is glyphosate. That's Roundup that's been sprayed on wheat. The yellow bars are the incidence of celiac disease. Pretty good correlation right there. What do you guys say? If you know anything about stats, I hate stats, st the statistics, the class, but this, there are quotient here is 98% correlation factor. That's incredible. That's almost unheard of. That those are dead on. Yeah, Lucas. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I think they just stopped at 2010, so it went down on 2010. I don't know what the last five years would look like. This is a. Uh, what's that? Yeah. It's, yeah, maybe, that, maybe, maybe Monsanto is cutting back. They love to cut back. You know, they love to cut budgets. Well, what, they, what they found, I guess, is that uh, weeds were developing immunity to uh, oh, yeah? patients. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So the weeds were developing immunity to, to life. So are they using something else now? Yeah, well, well they're, trying to, they're trying to talk farms into buying other, other seeds. Ah, uh, yeah, OK. The, the farms have to buy the seeds, so they'll, they'll, they'll work with the, uh, the uh, Roundup. Oh, yeah, OK. It's sort of a monopoly. It is, it is. It's a big one. <laughs> it is a big one. So here's another one. This is inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, this is actually from a movie, if you're interested in GMOs, a little, this is from a documentary called Genetic Roulette. Uh, but this is before GMOs. This is the eight years before and the eight years after. Not as sharp as the last graph, but still pretty good correlation that the chart's not staying flat and it's not going down. right? And they've done this in that movie. They show this chart for autoimmune diseases, for allergies, for asthma. And they also, you know, we play a movie in here called Bot, and they, and they show the charts in there too. And it's, it's eye-opening to see the charts and look at exactly when GMOs were introduced and what's happened to the incidents since then. You know, you can argue till you're blue in the face as far as causality, but it's not, we're not saying it's a causation, we're saying that it's a correlation. Right? And there's, you can't deny that there's a correlation. That's the same argument with autism and vaccines is, does it cause it? Well, I don't, I don't know and I don't care. It's a correlation. It's definitely a contributor. And you can't deny that when you see the graphs. So how does a bad gut go good, though? This is what we want to focus on for the rest of the night is really what can you do? Because for most of us, you know, we've been on an antibiotic or we have a symptom that we've talked about tonight or we have something that has happened to our guts in the past or we have something that's happened on the outside, a skin condition, allergies, asthma, maybe something that you've had for years and you've never heard until tonight that the gut had anything to do with it. So what can you do? That's what we want to focus on for the rest of the time. So we're going to go through each of these specifically, so you don't need to, to write all five of them down right now if you want, but change your diet is the first one. Address your stress. Number two, give your digestive system a break is number three. Number four is exercise regularly. And number five is take the right supplements. Supplements are probably the, the number one thing that people have questions on when it comes to gut health. But I kept that as number five because supplements, oftentimes we fall into a, a mechanistic way of thinking. You know, if we stay on this train of mechanistic versus vitalistic, even with oils, one of the reasons that I can't stand oils a lot of times is because we think about them very mechanistically. We think, what can I take for this? What can I take for this? What can I take for this? And it's the same way of thinking as medical thinking. What can I take for this? You've just changed out your pills for your oils, but you haven't changed the way that you think at all. So that's why even with supplements, supplements are important. Uh, there's several supplements, and we sell supplements, obviously, and there's several that I think that everybody should be on in omega, vitamin D. Um, but there are, you need to be taking the right supplements. And if you have a leaky gut, there's, there's some research that shows that maybe you shouldn't be taking some of those others, like an omega. But we're going to go through each one of these. So the first one is change your diet. The reason that this is the first one is because it's the easiest, and it's the one that you do every single day. This is the easiest when it comes to everything health-wise. It's your decision what you put in your mouth, 
right? So then whose responsibility is it to change that? Ours, right? It has to be your responsibility. You're putting the food in your mouth so you can't put the responsibility on anybody else. You can't blame Monsanto or McDonald's or any company or any restaurant. You went there, you chose the food, and you put it in your mouth. But here's a couple things that you can do to change your diet right now to increase your gut health. The first thing is what should you add in? Yep, fermented foods. Fermented foods is the first thing. So there's a couple of things that we can add in. So I want to talk about this for a second because fermented foods is something that you know, I'm just getting into. Um, but what happens is, uh, like I'll show you, this is a probiotic that I brought, and we'll talk about it in a minute, but it has 85 billion cultures in it, which is called CFUs, Colony Forming Units. That's how they measure the strength or the potency of a probiotic. We'll talk about that in a minute, but 85 billion sounds like a lot, right? When you look for a supplement, you want it to be over 10 or 15 billion. That's a good, a good form of supplement. When they've measured fermented foods in one bite, you can be in the trillions. So there's a ton of good beneficial bacteria from fermented foods. And a lot of gut health diets, a lot of gut health cleanses incorporate fermented foods. So there's a lot of ways that you can do it. That's what the picture is right there. You can ferment anything, as far as I know. And it, Sauerkraut is a great example. Kimchi is another good example. You can ferment like red peppers, bell peppers, green beans. Um, has anybody in here had a lot of experience with fermenting foods or culturing or canning? I just know that you um, pickle. Yeah, you pickle anything. Yeah, so one of the things is I buy it. That's why I don't know a lot about it. I bought a starter culture. Uh, that's a, that you can start it with uh, just using, like just with sauerkraut, you don't need a starter culture. Uh, you can just use the, uh, the cabbage. But you can get a starter culture and you just put it in a can with these foods. You leave it out on the counter for three or four days, two, three, four days, and you just let it sit there until you like the taste. That's how they say to, to know when you're done. Taste it and when you, you, you culture it to taste. But it's developing these bacteria in there and then when you eat it, you're getting them. But the starter culture, you know, I bought it online for like, 20 bucks, and it makes some absurd amount, like 500 gallons of food or something that I'm never going to be able to make. But for 20 bucks, it's going to last me a lifetime. So there's a couple things that you can look into. Start looking into fermented foods, how you can start adding those into your diet. But like I said, I buy them. So you can buy them places. At Real Foods, we're going to do our shop with the doc at Real Foods on Wednesday night, where we're going to walk through and just look at some of their gut health options. What's that? Sourdough bread. Yeah, sourdough bread is not one that we encourage, though, because we're not bread people, because that's a sugar. So you're feeding, you're feeding candida with sourdough bread, but it is cultured, and it is, like, if, I go, if I'm getting a sandwich, a lot of times I'll get sourdough over other choices because it does have cultures in it. But bread is something that we typically talk about cutting back on breads and grains. Mm -hmm. Tiffany? Does the coconut um, yogurts and stuff, would those have the same uh, they have some cultures in it. It will say what, what cultures are on there if it's a, a cultured yogurt. But yeah, you can flip it over and it'll say the strains that are on there. Uh, and it'll usually say how strong it is too or what the, what the CFUs are. Uh, but yeah, cultured, cultured almond milk yogurt, cultured coconut milk yogurt, uh, cultured... Yeah, it'll say cultured. Yep, so that's what you want to look for. If it doesn't, then it likely won't have the... You know, like Dannon isn't going to have any, any probiotics in it. Um, but if it says cultured, which a lot of them do, especially around here, um, yeah. So fermented foods, huge one. So look into that. That's something that, you know, you could go, the people around here teach classes on it. You know, we could teach a whole 60-minute class on how to ferment foods and how to can. But look into it if that's something that you're interested in. One of the things that I buy, we'll look at it on Wednesday night at Real Foods. I think it's called like Veggie Delight. It is amazing. It's like a salsa. And it is so good. Um, so if you tried it, that's another thing. Uh, sometimes you just hear this and you're not that tempted to try it because it might not sound that good. But try it. And a lot of times your body is craving these foods. So you try it or you try a kombucha and you're just, you just want more. That's a good sign that you need some good probiotics if you're really craving these foods. So kombucha, that's the next one. This is a great thing that you can add in. It's a drink that you drink on a daily basis. I brought one here. This is, has anybody ever seen this? It's called Mama Chari. So that's the front and center one right here. So this is, uh, this is local to Salt Lake. So it's the only kombucha brewery in Salt Lake. And they have a tap room. I went last week and filled up a, a growler. You guys know what growlers are? 
<laughs> I filled up a growler with kombucha, and it's gonna la it lasts a month. Uh, so you have kombucha on tap. I actually meant to bring it. I forgot it because I was going to let you guys sample it. It's mint lime. It's delicious. And I'm, I'm the one that craves it. it. Where is it at? It's at 455 South, 400 West. What I want to know is why well, put that tish nasty. No, it's really, really good. Oh. That she makes? No, the chia kombucha at like Whole Foods. Oh, yeah. You like that? Yes, but you don't taste. Yeah, it's, it's, has anybody ever had chia kombucha? I love that. It's like drinking jelly. It's it's weird, yeah. I put I put chia seeds in my in my shake today, and they you know they get they're gelatinous, you know they they're kind of have a gel to them. But this one is like really thick. I I think we had I had a patient bring it to me once. But what kombucha is? It, let's I'll just read it. It's a fermented beverage made adding a symbiotic culture of bacteria and yeast to sweeten tea. One of the biggest issues with kombucha is that it's made, by, it's made with sugar. So if you're on an advanced plan, if you're on an anti-sugar diet, which we encourage, is not necessarily the best thing. But mamachari is a low-sugar kombucha, but it still definitely has sugar. So that's something to be aware of. If you're on a low-sugar diet, just add in the fermented foods. Another thing is you can add in raw milk or kefir. That's one of the reasons why raw milk is beneficial, and kefir is like a, a thicker version of, of raw milk. Um, I don't really know exactly how they get it or how they skim it. But, uh, or an amasi. Amasi is another good one. But all those have beneficial probiotics. That's why raw milk is better than pasteurized or homogenized. Because pasteurization, that's exactly what they do, is they heat it up to kill the bacteria. So they not only kill the bad bacteria, but they kill all the beneficial and all the good bacteria too. So if you're drinking milk, I haven't drank milk in probably 10 years, but if you're drinking milk, I would encourage raw milk. But here's the things to take out. So the things that we already talked about, like sugar, right? So we're gonna, every workshop you ever come to at our office, you're probably going to talk about sugar because it contributes to every topic. It contributes to every disease, and it's destroying our health. Um, processed foods, huge. GMOs, like we already talked about, huge. So take those out. Get the pesticides out. Get the additives out. Get the preservatives out because those toxins punch holes through the lining, but then once you get those out, start adding these things in first. So maybe I should have flipped these around because first, you want to take that out. You don't want to be putting in the good stuff and then following it up with the bad stuff. Take the bad stuff out first, then start re-inoculating your gut with these good bacteria. So that's the first thing, change your diet. So how does a bad gut go good? Number two, address stress. So like we talked about, there are a lot of things that you can do with this. So I, I'm going to explain a little bit about this too because has everybody ever, ever heard of the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous systems? Does anybody know what they control? What's the sympathetic, first off? Does anybody know what it's often called? Fight or flight. Who said that? Where did that come from? Yeah. Fight or flight. So that's the sympathetic nervous system. So we're going to put that right here. Sympathetic. Fight or flight, that is your stress response. That is exactly the stress response. That's why stress is so damaging because stress, like I said, is a good thing. You know, if I'm up in the mountains and I see a bear, my body's going to go into fight or flight because I got two choices. I can either fight if I'm stupid or I can flight, right? And that's what I'm going to choose. Um, but that's a good response, right? It, it takes your blood flow out to your muscles. It even does things like raise your blood pressure, raises your cholesterol, because if I get a cut from a bear, I need to be ready to heal that, right? So clotting factors get raised. It's a smart response. But what happens in our society is we wake up and we're five minutes late for the alarm, stress response. Then we drive on the highway to get to work and somebody cuts us off, stress response. Then we get there 10 minutes late and the boss is mad at us, stress response. And we're in this stress response constantly and it affects our gut. The other side is the parasympathetic. You don't hear quite as much about this one. Does anybody know what this one's called? So this one's fight or flight. This one's rest and digest. Rest and digest. But think about this. How many of us eat our meals in a stress-free environment? We often eat them on the go, you know, in a hurry and just stress. We eat them in a stress-free environment. One of the things that I've actually been doing since I learned about this uh, in the last couple weeks is taking nine deep diaphragmatic breaths before I start eating. If you do that, we don't have time to do it as a group, otherwise it'd be kind of cool, but if you do that, I've also I've started playing with it because now I'll do like, try to take, do deep breathing while I drive from my apartment to the, to the office. I just live like three minutes away. 
but I just do these deep breaths and it, you can literally feel a systemic difference in your body and you feel your heart rate drop, you feel your stress levels drop, you feel yourself get a little bit more clarity of mind and a little bit more focused. So that's incredibly important. You can switch yourself over and most of us are in sympathetic dominance because our sympathetic systems get so overused. That's why the gut can lead to adrenal fatigue and adrenal burnout and through that's through the, the stress hormone called cortisol. Uh, but that's how it happens. The rest and digest, it's incredibly important that you're eating, your, or you're allowing your body to digest in a peaceful environment. So that's something that I would encourage you to just start doing. If you feel like you eat on the go a lot, start, just take 30 seconds or a minute before you eat and take as many deep diaphragmatic breaths as you can. So what that means, if you've never heard that, your diaphragm is right here. It's a muscle that pulls your lungs open. So you wanna breathe from your stomach, not from your chest. And you can really take a nice deep breath in through the nose, out through the mouth. You will literally feel a difference. The other one is meditate or pray daily. You know, I do both of those um, every day and they help, uh, help a lot. Um, yeah, a lot. So meditation is more of just, you know, letting your mind go to, go to nothing. Prayer is more specific. Um, but you can go either, you know, whatever your, your beliefs are. But faith, faith is a huge thing Whatever your faith is, it's a huge thing to help stress levels. Massive. Uh, do deep breathing exercises, so that's like the diaphragmatic breathing. Uh, and don't forget about the other kinds of stressors. So that's why we get up in the morning and we do our wobble exercises, even if our back doesn't hurt, because that is a stressor. Your spine, any loss of mobility in any joint is a stressor. And there's a ton of research on what happens systemically from losing range of motion in any joint. And it makes sense in the knee, it makes sense in the hip, but most people never think about the fact that there's six joints per vertebrae and there's 24 freely moving vertebrae. So there's a lot of joints in the spine. If any of those joints aren't moving fully, that is a stressor, that is a rock in your backpack. So you got to address your stress. Number three, you can give your digestive system a break. It takes about 18 hours to digest each meal. So your body is always in digestion because you're always, always, always eating. So a couple things that you can do. Yeah, the font got a little smaller. I see some eyes straining. But a couple things that you can do that give your digestive system a break. One is juice. So how many people have heard of juicing? Most people. Uh, how many people have done it? Yeah, a lot of us too, so that's really good. Uh, but one of the reasons why juicing is so good, one, it's a, it's a nutrient expressed right into your bloodstream. So you're getting the nutrients from the food. Your body doesn't have to break the food down. That's, that's the other reason, though, why it's so good is because it gives your digestive system a break. Your digestive system doesn't have to do any work to break down the fiber and to break down the foods. So you can do you know, any amount of days. You can do one day, really. You can do three, you can do five, you can do 10. There are people that have done 30, 60 days, the people that have done uh, longer than that. Um, but and I'm not necessarily recommending that right now, but you can give your digestive system a little bit of a break, allow it to get some healing, uh, and when it catches some healing, then you can start re-adding these foods in, see how you respond. So you can give it a break by that way. Another way is intermittent fasting. Has anybody heard of intermittent fasting? So it's, you, you, just, you still eat, and you still eat three meals a day, but you give your body a longer break. So you eat during eight hours of the day. So if you've ever heard of, has anybody ever heard of Dr. Mercola? Dr. Mercola is really big on, on intermittent fasting. But so what he suggests, and you can do it at any increments, but say you eat breakfast, a later breakfast. You eat breakfast at 10 a.m. Then you eat lunch at you know, 1 p.m. Then you eat your dinner at 6. So from 10 to 6 are the eight, is the 8-hour period that you're eating. Then you don't eat the other 16 hours. You give your body a break for those other 16 hours, and it helps with your digestion, allows your gut to process the food, to break down the food, and also get a little bit of healing too so that you're not just constantly overloading it. The last thing, how you can give your gut a break, is heal and seal your gut. This is something that I, I'm guessing that a lot of people are going to want to learn more about because we're just kind of scratching the surface with it, but you can do a leaky gut cleanse. And what that involves, or the one that we recommend the most, is a bone broth cleanse. Um, there are vegan versions of, of leaky gut cleanses too, but this one is bone broth. Bone broth is really good to allow your gut 
to heal and seal. That first phase, that phase one is called heal and seal of a bone or of a leaky gut cleanse. So you're sipping on nothing but bone broth for three to seven days. And I've had some patients say, you know, they get a little bit lightheaded or things like that. What you can do is you can eat coconut milk or coconut oil rather, along with it. like a spoonful of coconut oil is an instant shot of energy. Um, so if you're, if you're doing this and you're not feeling so good, that's something that you can do. But you go bone broth for three to seven days, allow the gut to begin healing, allow the intestinal wall to begin healing. Then you start adding in the, the good stuff. You first start with adding in the probiotics and re-inoculating the gut. So that's adding in fermented foods and probiotics. Has anybody ever heard of the GAPS diet? GAPS, so a couple people. It stands for gut and psychology syndrome. Uh, or some, it's also gut and physiology syndrome. Same thing. Um, but that is something that's really big in the autistic community. But GAPS is, this is kind of a shorter mini version of a GAPS diet. There's a lot of fermented foods. There's a lot of broths and a lot of soups with a GAPS diet. And then the last phase, you start to reintroduce your normal healthy diet. Okay, and so that doesn't mean reintroduce your processed foods, your sugars, things like that. It means you start to reintroduce your clean, whole foods, the foods that you should have been eating in the first place. But if, sometimes if you take a little break, then you start introducing these again, you get started off on the right foot. And if you get started off on the right foot, it's a lot easier to stay on the right foot. So those are the three phases. If anybody wants more information about this, what we want you to do is just leave your email address and we can send it to you because we can send you the info for the leaky gut cleanse uh, if that's something that you're interested in trying um, or just reading about, learning more about that. Are there any concerns with that with I don't know. I'd have to look into that. That's a great question. I'm sure there are. Yeah, there, there almost have to be. It's something to, to keep an eye on. Uh, number four, exercise regularly. There's not a lot to talk about here. Just, just do it, like Nike said, you know, just do it. Uh, exercise, like I said, has been shown to immediately promote diversity of the gut flora. It also, any muscular contractions, start that lymph system moving. Your lymph doesn't move very, very fast. It doesn't move very fast at all compared to, you know, your blood flow or something like that. But any muscular contractions stimulate lymph movement, stimulate that immune system working and flushing out the bad and keeping the good. So exercise is incredibly important. The other thing that exercise does is it immediately reduces your stress and reduces the stress hormone cortisol. So that's not just that you feel less stressful after exercise, it's that your body is under less stress. It decreases cortisol. One of the things that chiropractic adjustments have been shown to do, decrease that stress hormone cortisol. And number five, take the right supplements. So this is the one that we have the most questions on and that we're gonna spend the rest of our time on for the most part are the, the supplements here. So the first one, can everybody see that? I don't know if you can see that from back there, but this is one that we recommend the most. Uh, there are a lot of different options out there. I've got some up here, I'll show you, I'll pass them around. But this says raw probiotics, so we'll pass it around. Um, there says women, women 50 and wiser. You like that, 50 and wiser instead of 50 and older? Uh, uh, they're smart. Men and men 50 and wiser. They're also smart because there's not a big difference between any of the four of them. I've looked at them. There's not a huge difference. So some are refrigerated, uh, some are not. So this one was absolutely refrigerated, but like Dr. Mercola's probiotic, we'll look at it Wednesday night at Real Foods, it's not refrigerated. Um, so there's a couple differences there between refrigerated and non. The, the people that refrigerate theirs, they say that it should absolutely, you should absolutely get a refrigerated one. The people that don't, they say you should absolutely get a non-refrigerated one. So as I haven't really deciphered what the, what the difference is, but we've gotten good results with this, myself personally, and a lot of our patients. This is one that we recommend the most. But probiotics, so over 50 billion is what I would recommend. Sometimes online you can see like, you should look for something over 10 billion. That's not very strong. Uh, for, if you're looking for a, a big probiotic or a, a broad spectrum probiotic is what we call it. The other thing to look for is the strains. So at least 10 strains. Those are the different kinds of bacteria. This one, for example, is 85 billion CFUs and 31 different strains. The women's is like 32, so I think they added another strain. I don't know what the difference is there, but there is a, a slight difference. But you want to look for a lot of strains and a lot of dosage, a, a good uh, broad spectrum. The thing with probiotics is that you excrete anything that your body doesn't need or doesn't keep. So you're not, I'm sure you could overdo it, but I've never read of any probiotic toxicity or anything. 
um, you excrete all the extra. Uh, but this is another one that, that will show, you know, the, the reason I like these two is because I know the owners of both of the companies. They're, they're out of Colorado, so I used to work with them when I worked in Colorado. Um, but they, and they showed me, the lady, Nikki, that owns this company, she showed me the lab report where they had this tested, and they had it, and it was, where's the number? Because it was strong. 100 billion probiotics in a one tablespoon serving. So this one's 85 billion, this is 100 billion. But this is a really good one, 100 billion CFUs, not as many strains though. So when you're looking at this one of 31 strains, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven in this. So still pretty good though because it's really strong, but if you're not getting the, the results that you want, then you might wanna go for a more broad spectrum. But this one, one of the things, probably the most popular use for this is our families with kids because it's really, really good, uh, really good. Or if you make a smoothie, like with berries, put a tablespoon of this in with your smoothie, and it's really, really good. Uh, this, is, uh, this is tropical, there's berry, and they're all kind of fruity. Uh, another thing, too, is just to touch on real, just for a brief second, um, but, you know, we give a probiotic to our babies. Uh, you know, they were born naturally, but they, they were on, one of them got put on antibiotics. I got her off of them real quick, but... Um, so they're on a probiotic, definitely, and I think a lot of babies should be, especially if they're not breastfed. Yeah, we have twins, for those of you that don't know. Um, so yeah, they're, they're definitely both on a probiotic. So that's for all ages. So that's why a lot of our families get this. And you can do, I've done at times this and this. Another thing is, I'll put this in a smoothie. That's the way that I typically take it. I break it open and just dump it into a smoothie. Yeah, because it's a capsule. So you just pour the powder into your smoothie, and that's, that's pretty much how I do it. So the next supplement, uh, the next one is an enzyme. They're broad spectrum, they're full spectrum. So this one has 22 enzymes. Um, so this one has more, it's a more broad spectrum, trying something different. It also has a probiotic in it, and it also has some herbs in it. So some of the herbs that are really good for digestive health, marshmallow root, ginger root, um, astragalus root, I've never heard of that one, but marshmallow and ginger are really popular and common for, for gut health. But there are two different ways that you can take digestive enzymes. One is with every meal, to help you break down your meal. Another one, though, that a lot of people don't know about is take it on an empty stomach. It goes into the bloodstream and can digest undigested particles as they're in your bloodstream. So if you feel like you have a leaky gut, you have food insensitivities, or you know you do, you can take this on an empty stomach and it will clean out those undigested toxic food particles from your bloodstream. So you can take it with food and then you can take it in between and then you can take it again with food. So you can, or you can do one or the other. Um, so with food would be like if you're getting indigestion or you feel like as you're digesting a food, it's not, it's not breaking down or you're getting symptoms from that, then I would take it with the meal, see how it responds to that. If you feel like it's you know, allergies, asthma, something that's not like I eat a meal, I get a symptom, is something more like autoimmunity, this one, or not, not this one, but take it in between meals. Can pass you, those. Can you take it at the same time you take the probiotic? Yes. Yes, you can take it at the same time that you take the probiotic too. Good question. Yeah, you absolutely can, can do that. Uh, the next one is ours. It's called Max GI. So this is more of a maintenance digestive supplement, but it kind of combines a lot of the things that we're talking about. It has enzymes, it has probiotics, and it has some essential oils and some herbs in it. So it has, and, and I'm going to shout some of these out. So these are the enzymes, protease. What do you guys think that breaks down? Protein. Protein. What about lactase? Lactose, yeah. Uh, what about pectinase? Sugar, pectins, yeah. So the, all these have ACEs on the end. That's how you know that it's a, an enzyme or digestive enzyme. So this has, so more enzymes actually than the, uh, more enzymes than the mega food. I don't think it's probably as strong as, as far as the milligrams, but it does have quite a bit of enzymes. Uh, it also has clove oil powder, oregano oil powder, thyme oil powder. So a couple essential oils that have been shown to really help soothe the gut. So this is a really good maintenance gut supplement. Um, that's not quite, you know, if you think that you need one of those for a specific reason, then go for one. But if you think you need one for just generalized gut health, this is a really good one, Max GI. Couple other ones. The first one is L-glutamine. So this is L-glutamine. Um, that is good for sealing the gut. That's exactly what it's for, is sealing the gut. Uh, so this is probably out of these five, you know, I just wanted to throw those on there so you can see some other ones. Like I said before, I'm not into 
take this for this and this for this and this for this and this for this. I'm into a vitalistic way of thinking. So with a vitalistic way of thinking, I take digestive enzymes and probiotics, not for any specific reason other than for overall health. Uh, that's the same thing, but if you think that you have a leaky gut, you could take a glutamine supplement to help heal and seal that gut. Uh, so another one, collagen, that's another one that you can buy or it's in some leaky gut supplements. Quercetin, that affects the gut and affects, uh, you, you might have also ever heard of it from, uh, it's a natural antihistamine, which are an, your histamines are produced in your gut, so that's how quercetin affects the gut health. Uh, zinc is another one, and magnesium, so those are elements that can help with, with intestinal permeability. Deborah, this is the one that I recommend. This is ours. Uh, so I, there are a lot of different kinds of magnesium. There's also a lot of different kinds of zinc. I took a zinc for a while for like an immune support, um, and I, it didn't respond. It's the only thing I've ever taken that I didn't respond very well to. I felt really weird every time I took it, uh, and so I had to stop. Um, but there are a lot of magnesiums. The biggest thing is going with a brand that you trust. So that's why I like you know, to get them from, from our company because I know that they're very, very, very particular about the quality. Uh, but there's a lot out there. And also, magnesi or, uh, yeah, magnesium, they say that magnesium is possibly the number one deficiency in our country, the number one mineral deficiency in our country. But it's hard, it's hard to know um, whether or not you have it. It can cause migraines and cause a lot of other things. But and again, it's not one. That's why I put these as others. These are the ones that are more if you know that you need them, then go and get them. But if you haven't had any testing, you don't know that you need them, then you're playing roulette. Uh, you're shooting in the dark, but these, you're shooting in the dark, but you're shooting with a machine gun. You're going to hit something. But these, you're shooting in the dark with a sniper rifle. You're not going to hit anything. And, and if you, you know, you can read up on it. Just don't take it just because I'm talking about it right now. You know, go home and read up on a, about it. Don't ask Dr. Google. Don't ask WebMD, but read some, from some reliable sources and read about the signs or symptoms of zinc deficiency and see if that sounds like you. One of the problems though is that you start to read about signs and symptoms, everything is going to sound like you. Like, man, I'm, I've got brain fog, i got low energy, I want to lose some weight, yeah, I need that. So just be very, very careful is all I'm saying and don't just go home and, talk, and buy it just because we talked about it tonight. A probiotic, if everybody in here went out tonight and bought a probiotic, that would be fine. I would be happy with that. But everybody in here doesn't need to go out and buy these things tonight. Learn a little bit more. And, and you know, you don't have to do your own research. Ask me. I just can't cover it tonight. But I can send you information. I can email you. We can have a consult about any of these things. But you can also do testing. You can also get tested for all these things, too. See, there's a lot of testing that, that we do here. Food allergies and insensitivities, we can test for that. Celiac profile, which is a, an immune response, like looking for an allergenic response to gluten. Intestinal permeability, you can test for that. Uh, and then the maximized metabolics, that's our most thorough testing. It tests over 50 different biomarkers, and including some in the gut and gut health. So that's what these are, you see the label's a little different than the typical maximized living label. These are maximized metabolics supplements. So these go along with the metabolics program. I'm going to show you the gut health, what we can test in the gut health there. Whoop. So these are detox indicators. Then these are compounds of, it says bacterial or yeast origin. So you're looking at biomarkers that are produced by the bacteria in your gut or by yeast if there's a yeast overgrowth. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight different biomarkers for the bacteria in your gut. There's one for specifically for acidophilus. So if you've looked at the probiotic section, you've seen the word acidophilus. That's the most common single strain probiotic that you can get is acidophilus. Um, and so that's looking at that one specifically. This one's looking at clostridial species. And then this one's looking at yeast or fungus, so a candida overgrowth. So we can test this to know specifically what is going on. But like I said, this is my mom's test. So she wasn't... Uh, she wasn't, she was below the limits for some of these. So she wasn't in a bad range, but she was, they didn't even register. So I definitely got her on a probiotic after this. Uh, so, and, she, and she's been on that for about a month now, I'd say. But yeah, you can get that tested. But uh, the last thing is, just in, in closing, you know, don't think that even though the digestive system is linked to so many things and can cause so many things, and is so, so crucially important. The number one thing that I just want everybody to keep in mind tonight is the difference between that, that mechanistic and vitalistic way of thinking. 
the digestive system is not everything, right? And if you even look at, you know, I've got the picture up there, you have to start with what controls the digestive system. You know, you have an amazing digestive system, but if you cut the nerves going out to your intestines, going out to your stomach, going out to your gallbladder, you have no digestion. The brain and the nervous system is what controls all of your digestion. You have to look at these systems in the order of importance. And the spine and the nervous system controls everything else. So I start with the spine. That's my favorite topic because it controls everything else. Make sure there's as little to no interference in there as possible. Then you move on to the gut and you begin to work your way out. The body heals from above down, inside out, but we always try to treat it from outside in, below up. You have to look at it in the way that it heals and start from that way and work from above down to inside out. And when you look at subluxation, this picture, you're never going to be able to see this. I couldn't find a bigger image of it. But this is, uh, I wish that you could, because this is the neurological pathways of what happens when your body gets adjusted. So sometimes you think you come in and you get a crack or a pop, or oh, it didn't pop this time, Doc. I love that one. Um, but you think that, that the adjustment worked or it didn't work. There are thousands and thousands of known systemic effects from subluxation, which is a misalignment of your spine that affects the nerves, and there are thousands of effects whenever your body gets adjusted. Subluxation causes not only pain, but pain also causes a lot of other pathways. It causes nocic or nociception is pain, causes decreased range of motion, and decreased range of motion causes pain. It's a vicious cycle, but then it also just affects all the hormones, and there's a cascade of inflammation that comes from pain pathways. So that's the next one, inflammation. Infl it, when we think about inflammation too, we think about, oh, my knee or my hip or my ankle, but inflammation is a massive, massive process in your body. There are thousands of different compounds that are related to the inflammatory pathways, different cytokines, and it's not just in your joints or in your muscles or on the outside. The biggest concern is cellular inflammation, Cortisol levels, that's your stress hormone. So that's the fight or flight like we're talking about. There is a lot of research and it keeps coming out more research on every single time you get adjusted, your cortisol levels lower. And even if you get adjusted one time and then you never get adjusted again, they've shown long-term changes in your body's cortisol production. So it's not even that you have to be under current chiropractic care, even though you should be, but even if you've been, ever been adjusted, it has changed the way that your body produces cortisol. Immune function. There's several studies showing the immediate immune system boost from a chiropractic adjustment. And the last one, HRV stands for heart rate variability. BP stands for blood pressure. So this system is just like the digestive system in that it affects and controls a lot of others. But this one is, it supersedes the digestive system because this is the control center for digestion. So you have to look at things in the order of importance, in the order of priority, starting with the nervous system, then working your way out. You have been listening to The Real Health Podcast with Dr. Taylor Crick. If you could please do us a favor and give us a five-star rating and a review on what you think of the podcast. We appreciate your feedback. Be sure to like us on Facebook, follow along on Twitter, Instagram, and of course, subscribe on YouTube. Thank you for listening to The Real Health Podcast with Dr. Taylor Crick. This episode has been sponsored by realhealthresource.com, your go-to resource for everything health, nutrition, and wellness. Be sure to like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter and Instagram, and of course, please visit our website at realhealthresource.com.